In today's session, I want to add a thread context system to the code base. The thread context system is going to help address two important problems. First, it's going to help with assigning unique private resources to each thread. And second, it's going to give me a very convenient way to tie a scratch memory pool to the frames on a call stack without having to manually pass it through the call stack everywhere. I use a scratch memory pool a lot. And in fact, even just parts of this OS layer that we haven't done yet, file reading in particular, uh, will be a lot easier with scratch memory. So I wanna get it in now so that we can use it for those things. Uh, and I'll explain more about what it is and how it works once I have the code written to show you. I have one final note before we get started coding. So far in this project, I haven't done a lot of experimentation. I've mostly stuck to ways of organizing and implementing things that I've already tried before and I'm happy with. But for this thread context, I am going to tweak it a little bit. Usually I consider the thread context just a part of the operating system layer, but I was thinking it might be interesting to see if it works out better when a lot of the thread context logic actually lives in the base layer and the operating system layer will be relegated to just providing the thread local storage aspect of how I do the thread context and it won't know anything else about the thread context type. I don't know how this will turn out, but I want to give it a shot and see if I like it better this way. So. What I'll be doing is keeping an eye on how things shake out after this decision. You know, the details around it, does it make certain things more verbose, less verbose? Does it let certain concepts be reused that weren't previously reusable? And determine if I like this setup better. And then if I ever do another code base, I'll have an answer to whether or not I like this one. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. In this setup, the OS layer is providing a very thin layer that just gives a thread context pointer with no additional type information. That way it's super thin and there's not a lot of extra detail going into how that gets ported or what has to be done with it when it gets used. And then the actual decision about what lives inside of the thread context is made by this thread context type in the base layer. This is kind of neat, I think, because now the concept of what's in the thread context isn't actually tied to the way the thread context gets stored and delivered. It could be that we get thread context in a different way sometime, or I don't know, we deliver something other than this type through the thread context system. So this is why I wanted to try this splitting of the concept into two parts. There's not a lot to do when we implement this in Win32 because Win32 has a TLS API, which stands for Thread Local Storage, that does basically exactly what I want, which is to assign a little bit of information about one pointer's worth to each thread so that you can set it and get it on that thread later. In other operating systems that maybe don't have this feature, there's still a lot of other stuff we'll be able to do to implement it. We can just build a data structure that maps IDs to these pointers and make it thread safe. Or if we're in a pinch and we can't even do that or don't want to, we can also just use a global variable and restrict ourselves to a single thread. So there's a lot of options for how much we actually bother to implement this on other thread or operating systems based on what we need from that operating system and what it's capable of. Okay, so next I want to implement my scratch memory pool and make it available through the thread context and probably also add some helpers to make it easy to access the scratch without having to manually get the thread context and cast it and stuff like that. So I'm going to put that stuff in there and then we'll talk about how the scratch pool works.
The big idea behind scratch memory is that a lot of the time code is just going to want to say I need some memory to work in. It doesn't need to stick around forever. I'm not returning this data to somebody else or anything. It's just I need to fill out some memory to perform some algorithm, crunch some numbers, and then throw away the notes that I had in that scratch memory when I'm done. So that's the thing it's trying to be is just a place where you can get memory that won't collide with anybody else and that will be freed very easily and quickly and sort of automatically for you. I've played with variations of this idea for a while, so it's gone through a number of iterations. And the big thing I've found that was interesting about setting this up is that something that is scratch memory in one perspective is not necessarily scratch memory in another perspective. For example, if I have a routine that gives me a list of search paths that I want to use to look for a file, that routine is going to think of an arena that I pass to it as a permanent allocation that it is returning back to the person who is calling it. Whereas the person getting that list might not actually need to keep the list around forever. They're just going to iterate it, search each path, and once they find the one that contains the file they want, they'll throw the list away. So for the caller, that arena is a scratch memory arena, but for the call E, it's a permanent arena that they don't want to clear at the end of the function. So this system just initializes a pool of several arenas and then can return one to the requester and can provide the additional feature of letting the requester specify that there are other arenas it is going to use for permanent allocation and it wants its scratch memory to not conflict with them. So for instance, in that example I had before of a routine that returns the paths, there might be a, a case where that routine itself needs to use scratch memory. And if it does, when it goes to get the scratch memory, it will simply say, I need scratch memory and I need it to not conflict with this arena, which I am treating as permanent uh, memory for my purposes. So that's my basic description of how the scratch memory stuff is meant to work. I'm going to turn now to thinking about the scratch memory helper here, and it sort of became clear to me as I was writing this that the idea I had of organizing thread context types into the base is just not really going to be very helpful because this scratch memory helper is a super important convenience helper that I'm going to use in code everywhere. And this code implicitly assumes that the thread context provided by the operating system and the type has the same type as the thread context provided from the base. And so having them spread out isn't really going to be very helpful because I can't effectively split them. Any code that uses this scratch helper is going to have to play by the same rules as the scratch helper. So there's just not really going to be any way to give the thread context a different type under different situations or use the thread context in a super different way. I think the idea of splitting them maybe is just reaching too far for a feature that is not going to pay off and is going to complicate things based on what I'm seeing here. So I'm going to simplify. I'm going to move the thread context into the helper he a header here instead and all of the thread context code here into the OS helper uh, CPP file as well. And we'll just call the thread context a feature of the OS helper code. And I think that that's going to just simplify the way things are laid out. It's going to let them just live next to each other since they are kind of tied to each other in terms of what they're each for. And it won't complicate the, the layer for getting and setting the thread context, which is still just as thin as it was for porting purposes, but it will sort of sort things in a way that makes a bit more sense.